Now let's turn our attention to iPad. had a chance to put it right this year and they kind of did but also kind of didn't in fact they may have made it even more confusing than last year's ipad models from five different ipad models with three different types of apple pencil to now four different types of ipad models with yet another new type of apple pencil thrown into the mix so what are the current ipad models now first there is the 8.3 inch ipad mini with four colors two storage options, and it works with either the second gen Apple Pencil or the Apple Pencil USB-C. There's the basic 10.9 inch iPad that comes in four colors, two storage options, and works with either the Apple Pencil USB-C or the first generation Apple Pencil. And then the iPad Air, which comes in two sizes, four colors, four storage options, and works with the Apple Pencil Pro and the Apple Pencil USB-C. And then we have the iPad Pro, which comes in two finishes, two sizes, two colors, four different storage options, and works with the Apple Pencil Pro and the Apple Pencil USB-C, all of which you can add cellular data to, and all of those with their own specific ranges of accessories. Simple. <laughs> And as far as Apple are concerned, that's basically how they're pitching these devices. You've got the iPad mini as the quote unquote kind of bottom tier iPad, right up to the pro level iPad Pro. When in actual fact, that order is kind of completely wrong. And I'm gonna explain why along with how to avoid the but if trap that I always find myself falling into when buying Apple products. I actually just fell into it a minute ago because I bought an iPad. And ultimately helps you buy the right iPad for you, depending on your budget. So let's start off talking about the latest and greatest iPad Pro. And I'm gonna call this the best iPad for businesses, professionals, and those who just want the very best. Now this year's iPad Pro is the thinnest Apple product ever made. I'm sure you've heard it before, and I mean ever. Like with options of either a 11 inch or a 13 inch version, and with the all new now M4 Apple Silicon chip powering what is arguably the most powerful tablet on the planet right now. You can choose four storage options, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But for now, just be aware that this year when buying either the one or two terabyte storage options, it also gives you three more things on the lower storage options. Now the first is you'll be getting a faster M4 processor with one extra performance core. The second is by ticking either the one or two terabyte options, you'll also be getting double the amount of memory going from eight gig to 16 gig of RAM. And thirdly, the one or two terabyte models again, also unlock a new nano texture glass option with specifically designed glass that reduces reflections and glare from really bright, you know, bright light sources, windows, sun, that kind of thing, whilst maintaining color accuracy and screen quality. Now that nano texture display though, does accumulate a lot of fingerprints very quickly as noted by basically everyone who's actually had one and picked one up so far. But the good news is that Apple includes their incredibly expensive polishing cloth in the box. Now that screen is very, very good at dispersing light Lights, but it does come at the cost of a little bit of image quality and color accuracy and saturation. Now the next question is whether you need any of these. And in my experience, if you are sitting there asking yourself, do I need to upgrade to the faster processor or do I need the extra memory? The answer is usually no, because the only people who are really pushing the iPad Pro to its limits will need the upgrades and they will know that they need those upgrades. Now in terms of the nano texture glass coating, it all feels a little like Apple are pushing people to you know, needlessly spend more money to buy a higher model that they don't need just to get this like new kind of screen coating. Now, another thing I've seen questions about is whether the new nano texture display makes the iPad feel more like a paper-like screen protector. So, you know, it feels more like paper when you're writing on it, drawing those kind of things. And no, it basically doesn't. It actually feels exactly the same as all the other iPads. So if you do want to have that paper-like feeling, just buy the paper-like screen protector, who coincidentally, are sponsoring this video, thank you very much, at a fraction of the cost of upgrading to this new nano texture coating option. And it's something I featured for years and years across this channel, it's a bit of a viewer favorite. Now, rather than it being etched directly into the glass like the nano texture display and available on only the more expensive iPad Pros, 
the Paperlike 2.1 is a screen protector that also doubles up by making that kind of glassy, smooth screen feel way more well, like paper. So when using any Apple Pencil on any iPad, it will feel a lot more like drawing or writing on real paper. And actually it sounds similar to Now this isn't the same as the new iPad Nano Texture. It actually uses their painted NanoDux technology to make it what it is. But for a avid note taker or an artist, Paperlike is the only way to make your iPad feel more enjoyable to use. It's also affordable and also available across all sizes and all iPads. And the best thing of all is that Paperlike has a 100 day satisfaction guarantee. So if you don't like it, or if you mess up fitting both of the included screen protectors in each pack, you can get a free replacement or a complete refund. So to give it a try, grab one using the link down below this video. And if you've used one before, why not just comment down below with your own experience to see what other people think as well. Now, speaking of the screen with the new iPad Pro, it is now OLED, so colors and contrast are much, much better than any of the other iPad models and uses a technology they're calling Tandem OLED, which is essentially two like OLED panels squashed together to give you all of the benefits of an OLED screen whilst also staying really, really bright. Now, in terms of the Apple Pencil, you can either use the Apple Pencil USB-C or use the new Apple Pencil Pro. And for most people, if you're buying you know, an iPad Pro for the first time and want or need a pencil for any reason, then the Apple Pencil Pro is really the only option to go for. It magnetically attaches to the side of the iPad. It charges wirelessly, has Find My support built in for when you inevitably you know, lose the pencil. And this year, there's the new pencil features such as squeeze and roll, along with haptic feedback. Now that genuinely makes all of the difference when using the Apple Pencil. Now in contrast, the USB-C pencil charges via USB-C, it's not wireless. It needs a cable to do so and has none of those additional features. And with the iPad Pro, that USB-C port also supports Thunderbolt, so you can hook up you know, other Thunderbolt accessories, storage, docks and hubs, which can then even turn your iPad into a you know, full-on, full-blown mobile workstation if you need to. Now, of course, the 2024 iPad Pro is by far you know, the best, the fastest, most powerful and stunningly beautiful iPad of them all. Of course it is. It is the most expensive one at starting at $999 for the 11 inch version or $1299 for the 13 inch model. And I think if anything I've just said to you is really getting you excited, you know, tandem OLED, thinnest product ever, Apple Pencil Pro, then by all means, buy an iPad Pro. But I actually think the next model down, the iPad Air, is the better overall buy because at almost half the price of the iPad Pro, the iPad Air starts at 599 for the 11 inch and then 799 for the 13 inch model, but without a lot of the potentially unnecessary features from the iPad Pro. So let's look at what you lose by going to the iPad Air. Now you lose the OLED Ultra Retina XDR display for a mini LED liquid retina display that's not as bright as the Pro. You lose 120 Hertz ProMotion, which is replaced with a 60 Hertz display. There's no nano texture coating on the higher storage models. The M4 chip is of course replaced by last year's M2 chip because they skipped the M3 chip this year. Thunderbolt via USB-C is replaced with just well, regular USB-C. So you can't do any recording in ProRes from the iPad Air. Face ID swaps for Touch ID. It also comes in some slightly smaller storage configurations. You get half as many speakers built in, half as many mics, and you can't shoot portrait photos on the air. And it doesn't have a LiDAR scanner. So if you're one of those people that you know, uses that to do like room or object scanning. Now, honestly, out of all of those features, the only ones I might get picky about are the 120 Hertz ProMotion and Face ID. Other than that, the screen is still great. Performance is great. I don't need to record ProRes video from an iPad, weirdly, and I barely even remember my iPad has a camera, let alone use it. And it still works with both the Apple Pencil Pro and the Apple Pencil USB-C. So is it really worth upgrading to the Pro to get 120 Hertz and Face ID? Now for most people, certainly for me, arguably not. So I think for most people, the iPad Air is the best option to buy. It's essentially last year's iPad Pro put into the iPad Air this year. Now, whether it's watching videos, replying to emails, or even more advanced workflow like video and photo editing, it really is a fantastically powerful iPad at a fraction of the cost of the iPad Pro. And the Magic Keyboards, like the iPad this year, basically is the iPad Pro of last year. Now, yeah, you're not getting the M4 chip from the iPad Pro, but guys and girls, seriously, since the first M1 iPad, I don't know of 
a single person who has complained about the iPad being slow. It's, it's just not. But what about the regular iPad? This one comes in at 10.9 inches. And since it's now had a pretty massive drop in price, I would say it is the best choice for, certainly for students, which by the way, don't forget, you can actually get more of a discount when using student discounts. It's also the only choice now for parents buying for their children. And it's also probably the best choice when buying one for you know your parents or grandparents. Like this iPad is the iPad that could with a few caveats. But the screen is great. The A14 Bionic chip is still plenty fast enough for most people. I wouldn't be trying to do any complex like video or photo editing on this, but it will still handle them. It does only come in 64 gig or 256 gig storage options though. And on my iPad, after you install a few apps, you'll find that 64 gig of storage can fill up rather quickly. But is there anything really missing from the basic iPad? Actually, no, other than it being a little bit slower than the M2 or the M4 chips from the you know, Pro or the Air. It's basically the same iPad as the iPad Air. It's also lighter than the iPad Air, which really begs the question why the iPad Air is the iPad Air at all. Just make sure you get the USB-C Apple Pencil if you need one, because the first gen Apple Pencil that does work with this iPad and that Apple still sells, doesn't stick magnetically and charges via lightning, which basically nobody uses anymore. Now, I would actually say that at a price of 349 bucks, this actually might be for the first time in a very, very long time that I can remember that I can honestly say represents excellent value for money and is priced almost exactly where I feel an iPad should be priced. It's not trying to be a replacement for your laptop, even though in some cases it could be. And it's definitely a near perfect device for the price for everybody I've mentioned before, for students, for kids, for adults who don't need a laptop grade M2 or M4 chip in an iPad. And so whilst the Air seems like the one that most people should be buying, all you're really paying for is the M2 chip. In which case, if you are happy with the speeds, then just save the money and just buy the regular iPads. It is perfect for general use, content consumption, reading, writing emails, web browsing, social media, and all of that kind of stuff. Which brings me to the iPad mini, which as far as I am concerned is the best iPad ever made. And it is by far the most usable iPad ever made. It has a slightly faster A15 chip over the regular iPad's A14 chip. It works with the second gen Apple Pencil and the USB-C Apple Pencil. And it is just unashamedly not a laptop. Like Apple doesn't even sell a keyboard for this iPad because they know it's not supposed to be a computer. Now this iPad is simply the perfect travel companion. You read books, listen to music, watch your favorite movies and TV shows. It is just small and compact, which means you can throw it into a bag, bring it on a flight with you. Heck, in some cases, it can even fit into your pockets. I just, I love bringing my iPad mini with me when traveling and particularly on flights because I get to bring my own entertainment with me. I can wear comfortable noise canceling headphones instead of those crappy airplane ones. And I get to block out everything around me. And then I'm not using all of my phone's battery on, you know, however long a flight I've got with me then fumbling around with charging cables and you know, hoping that the USB charger in my seat actually works. Now you're not buying the iPad mini because it's a powerhouse of an iPad that you could do, you know, professional things on. You're buying one because it's actually usable. It's convenience. It's an add on to what you're already carrying. Now, when I went to Barcelona earlier this year, I packed a 14.6 inch tablet with me, but I still had to then pack my laptop because the tablet couldn't then do everything my laptop could. And then I felt like an absolute idiot sat there on the plane holding this like ginormous tablet on my lap, like a sort of cinema screen. The iPad mini is the perfect companion. So in terms of sizes, whether it's 11 inch versus 13 inch or the 8.3 inch iPad mini, it totally depends on your use case. Now I've owned a 12.9 inch iPad Pro for the last few years or so, and I find myself barely using it. It's just the size of my laptop. And by the time I've added a keyboard, it costs more than my laptop, which just to me makes zero sense. So my advice is if the iPad is going to be your main device that you use every day and use it as if it were a laptop with a keyboard, but you don't want to buy a MacBook, by all means, go for the bigger 13 inch model. Otherwise, if you want to use it as an iPad, go for the smaller model. Now, the question of buying more storage is, of course, totally up to you. Now, for most people, the entry level storage for an iPad 
is just fine, whether that's just 64 gig or 256 gig. Download your apps, maybe a few movies, books, some music. Now I've always bought the lowest storage tier possible. And because of all my data is, you know, all my files are stored in either Apple or Google's cloud, I don't need a ton of local storage, which is great because Apple puts a huge premium on how much they charge for local storage upgrades. But if you need it, then of course, feel free to add more storage to your iPads. However, beware of the, I guess I'm gonna call it the but if trap. Take the base iPad as an example. But if I buy the basic iPads, I need to upgrade to the 256 gig of storage. So I may as well get the mini because it's faster. But if I do that, then it's cheaper to buy the iPad Air. So I'd be better off getting that. But I still need the 256 gig model. So I need to upgrade to that. And I still need a case. So let's add that one on again. But if I do that, it's basically the same price as an iPad Pro. So I might, I might as well buy that. And you've literally gone from spending $350 to over a thousand in only a few silly choices. But you can even take it further than that. But if I buy the 13 inch iPad Pro and add a keyboard, then I may as well buy a top spec 15 inch MacBook Air. Absolute madness. Now, one of the other decisions to make when buying an Apple product is whether to buy Apple Care, which if you're not aware, adds accidental damage protection along with an express replacement service where Apple will literally ship you a brand new iPad the very next day instead of having to wait and you know, send yours in to be repaired and, that, and wait for the delay. Now I've actually used this quite a few times on my iPhone and my Apple Watch and I think it's really worth it. But the question I would be asking though is when it comes to your iPads, is it just gonna stay at home or are you gonna be taking it out and about, working with it and taking it into potentially situations where it could be damaged, lost, dropped? Or do you have kids who might then mishandle it or accidentally drop it around the house? Now, those are a few reasons why you might want to consider buying Apple Care. Otherwise, if you wanna see why I think the iPad mini is the best iPad ever made, watch this video and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers, bye-bye.